Follow the cash, not the crowd. That's our next guest mantra. His golden rule certainly has paid off since the Fairhome Fund has outperformed all other funds in its category over the last decade. Joining us now from Miami is Bruce Berkowitz, manager of the Fairhome Fund and the new Focus Income Fund. He was recently named Morningstar's best U.S. stock manager of the year, oh, and the decade. Bruce, congratulations. It's so great to see you. Uh, nice talking <laughs> with you, David. Brian. Bruce, there are some funds that do well in up markets and then others that, sometimes, that do well in down markets, but you've managed to create a fund that does both. How do you run a portfolio that prevents it from being permanently aggressive or permanently conservative? Well, we assume that our shareholders, and we have a great shareholder base who has stood with us during a very difficult time, but we make the assumption that our shareholders have given us all of their money. And when we think about not losing as being rule number one and knowing that our shareholders are going to need the money in the future, I think we tend to be a bit more conservative and we, we keep tremendous amounts of cash on hand because cash is quite valuable when few people have it. Bruce, what is your cash hoard right now? Last time I looked, it was around 20%. But how, what was the lowest it went in the last year? And do you normally keep it about that size? You know, it ranges between usually 10 and 20%. We've averaged mid-teens cash since uh, the inception of the fund. It, 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 there have been times where it's gone lower, but most of the time... We are holding lots of cash, and as markets go down, we start to put the cash to work. Bruce, with the big announcement yesterday about the banks, does that change in any way your investing strategy? Uh, no, it doesn't. We, we're not gonna, we don't predict what happens. We, we do it based on price. We price in uh, difficult times. Uh, uh, but, you know, the banks are essential to the country. Uh, the, the country isn't going to start moving in a nice upward direction until we start to see the, the, the banks uh, in a strong position. And uh, while we don't necessarily agree with uh, some of the proposals, uh, we'll get through this period. Just as we've gone through with health care, we're very large owners of health care companies, and we built our positions uh, when the administration was threatening to basically nationalize our health care system, and we knew that wasn't going to happen. Seems uh, the industry seems to be, you know, in a much better footing now, and uh, companies such as Humana are doing well. And uh, maybe we'll have a chance to be big owners of banks if the administration starts threatening these onerous acts. Well, Pfizer, at the last look, Bruce was your largest position. You got over a billion dollars in it, and it's you know it's long term. It's been well tough owning it. How long are you sticking with that? And your reaction to what seems to be health care reform that's been tabled for Pfizer? Well, in general, I uh, don't want to talk about any specific positions in the portfolio and shifts, but in general, the, the, the companies such as Pfizer, Forest Labs, the health care companies, uh, their, their prices went off the cliff in relationship to the cash that they generate. Uh, once we see their prices start to come up uh, and get to a reasonable level or above a reasonable level with the cash they generate, we'll, we'll look to sell the positions. What industry looks the least attractive to you right now, Bruce? Oh, there are, there are many industries. <laughs> oh, don't say that. Well, some good news. Don't say they all look great. Things are getting I, better. I, uh, no. I'm, ag I'm agnostic about the markets. I'm agnostic about most industries. We're only focused on the companies that we, the portfolio is invested in. Our, you know, we, we, our top five, six companies plus our cash probably adds up to close to three quarters of uh, our portfolio. And our last, and it's been quite a uh, long time since our last public filing, and our next public filing will be in a couple of weeks' time. So okay. it'll be more uh, to talk about. Let me, about in a let few me ask you, how about, how about this then? Obviously, Warren Buffett making the biggest bet ever on trains, Burlington Northern. Do you agree with that? Is there something about the train business that's magic? Yeah, what, what's magic about the train business is it's, uh, it's steady, reasonable profitability. See, it, on, on the outside face of it, it, does it, look, it looks like an okay investment given the pricing. I mean, I, 
But if you take into account a company like Berkshire Hathaway with its huge uh, insurance companies and tens of billions of dollars of insurance flow, if you start to think about you know, maybe a third of the company is being bought with zero cost borrowed money, another third with very low interest rate money, which will be paid back quickly, and a third with shareholder equity, then all of a sudden on that basis, uh, it looks like a, a good investment given when you, when you take that strategy, you, you must be certain that you're not going to lose money. And the uh, railroads are quite regulated and, you know, they'll, they'll make costs plus a reasonable margin, which will turn out to be very good based on the way I believe he's financing the acquisition. And we should note that Berkshire Hathaway, you added back to the portfolio this past, well, last year, didn't yeah, we you? Yeah, uh, we sold it last year, probably a, a mistake. Right. I mean, it's always good to be, have Warren Buffett as a partner. But, be, uh, but with the crisis that we've had, mm -hmm. uh, he was able to put to, to use tens of billions of dollars from uh, cash earning 1% mm -hmm. to now investments yielding 10 plus percent. So big difference which are going to show up in Berkshire Hathaway's numbers. But it is and back in the, the portfolio. Company. It is back in Fairhomes. Yes, it is. Okay. It's, a, it's, a, it's a major position of Fairhomes again. I'm, I'm resting much easier now that Berkshire Hathaway's <laughs> back in the portfolio. You don't have to worry about Warren calling you either. Bruce, what about the new fund, the uh, focused income fund? What spurred you to start that fund? Was it just the deep discounts? the distress that you saw in fixed income in the last year or so? That was a, a good part of it. Uh, a good part of it is when we, when we, when we study uh, the equities companies and looking to buy equities, we study, we go up and down the credit structure of the company from their mm -hmm. bank debt uh, to their, their lowest form of, say, bond, which we consider to be an equity, a bond, uh, the most junior of bonds. And in our studies, uh, we found many securities that were good for the Fairhome Fund, but would have also been quite good for a focused income fund. May not have uh, the yield that we would want for the Fairhome Fund, but on a more conservative, more stable capital basis, would work out quite well. And then, uh, second point was that uh, you know I always believe. You should have some cash on the side. You should never have to be forced to sell investments during a difficult period. So with the extra cash I had on the side, I saw many opportunities that I would have liked to have purchased for myself. But at Fairhome, we only buy what we buy for clients. Right. So I didn't buy them, so I want to create a fund that we can all go into and take advantage of you know, uh, much higher income yielding securities than what you're getting in the bank or right. you know, or, or one-year money markets or intermediate-term bond mm -hmm. funds. And we're, we're looking to have a short duration, much higher interest uh, mm -hmm. yield. We'll see how it goes. We're optimistic. Bruce, one last thing. The Fairhome Fund is focused about 20 stock positions the last time I looked. And the fund had $11.2 billion in it. At what size would you have to change your strategy? At what size would you maybe close it? Well, uh, as we get bigger, we, we have to make bigger investments. And now in a difficult environment that we've been in and continue to, to be in, uh, that, that works to our advantage. Uh, so we, we, we do have critical mass now, which has helped us tremendously, especially doing private deals, private transactions, mm -hmm. where we can do the entire transaction ourselves, uh, the fund can do. But over time, it will become more difficult. And when, when times get more buoyant, uh, it will be difficult uh, it, when there will be le fewer opportunities. Right now, difficult environment, great opportunities, especially as companies are rebuilding their balance sheets and their profitability. Uh, when, when, we, when we have a rosy consensus down the road and everything's back to uh, whatever the new norm is, uh, then we'll have to think about closing down the fund if we can't put the money to work. But it's closing down the fund. Uh, the bigger problem is going to be performance. If we continue to perform, then uh, 11, 12 billion will become 24 billion, and 24 will become 48 billion, and that's going to be a bigger issue than worrying about the money coming in and out of the fund. Bruce, please come back. Will you promise you'll come back? In <laughs> I promise. Okay.